I want to go to the Word of God and today I know it's a very special day to many people. People are anxious of many things. Uh, when I was preparing this sermon, I thought I would come here when you have your good news or whichever news you had. But today I'm speaking when you are, all of you are waiting, in the waiting season. But I want to speak to you about thriving in all seasons. Thank God, God dropped that message to me. Because if I had come with that message than said, I have come to deliver what God has delivered from, for us, I don't know how I would have changed my message from yesterday to today. So God dropped a message in my heart, thriving in all seasons of life. We live different days. Sometimes you are happy, sometimes you are not. In the morning you take breakfast, in the afternoon you take lunch. Don't take lunch in the, afternoon, in the morning. So we must thrive in all seasons of life. A man by the name Jim Rons uh, wrote a book about uh, thriving or seasons of life. And one of the many things he mentioned, he says, there are varied seasons of life. All of us, whether rich or poor, you know also being rich is a season. There is a day you can be poor. I want to mention to you, you must know that young or old, all of them are seasons. At one point you are young, but you are not old now. You are growing older. It's a season. Educated or not educated, it's a season. A time we were not learned, but then it's a sum total of all of those people and events that have touched us since we entered this world. Every thought we have entertained has had its effect on us um, up to now. Every movie, some of us watch movie or which station we were watching this week, uh, we had some favorites. You could go to Citizen and you feel you are somewhere. You go to NTV and you feel you are somewhere. And you turn at one point. It has had an effect on you. And every election in this country has had its effect on us. Every election, I'm saying. Because we have had so many elections and this is not the last one and this is not the first. has had an effect. It's a season in our life. Every disappointment Every trump, every doubt, every dream, for many of us who dream, every love and every transition whatsoever has had its effects on us. What we are and what we have have slowly been brought by ourselves. Now, you need to understand that every season you go through and now every response, I'm not believing is a reaction, is how you produce it to yourself. You may not blame anyone else. Although sometimes we blame the government, I would blame my elders, you blame your wife, you blame your children, you even blame church leaders or even political parties. You would do that. These events or those people and events which have left a mark, whether favorable or unfavorable, I want to believe as you thrive, or if you want to thrive, you must allow them to be behind you. Otherwise, you get stuck and stuck and stuck. I lost some money some time back. I kept on going to my bag, but it's lost. I thought I had not checked very well. I almost had the bag. You need to come to the point of saying, it is gone. Otherwise, you loiter around, loiter around, and loan up. What has happened? even as recently as today or as yesterday, um, um, it's no longer of any consequence in terms of you thriving, but as a consequence of how you live. And we choose to see what we need to do. What is of great importance is who and what is uh, that, uh, that it leaves to you today and makes you as you move forward and do many things as you go forward. What we are being is an established and unchangeable pact. What we can yet become is unlimited. It's unlimited. And it is a boundless opportunity. Therefore, do not allow your awareness of the past thoughts, past difficulties, um, past failures adversely affect your current living. And that is where we find many people. We thank God for the few soldiers that are in the house. Clap for yourself. There are people that are still on the election day. They are just imagining. We must be able to move on and see. Somebody said that there is times that 
you can even reap, okay, in different seasons. And that is what great entrepreneurs do. But now, um, um, I just allow me to go to the word of God in the book of Luke chapter 22. From verse 1 all the way to verse 38, I want us to read a season that I've actually put on Jesus. Jesus went through many seasons, be it that season of being not educated, being young, being old, being in ministry. But in Luke chapter 22, I see a very unique season that I want us to reflect on this morning. The Bible says from verse 1, if you are with me, I'm reading all the way to verse 38. I believe I will be able to read that in five minutes. Now, the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus. For they were afraid of the people. And then Satan entered Judas called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand over Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparation for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room? Um, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished, make preparations there. They left and found the things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks, said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Okay? And he took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of whom who is going to betray me is with me on the table. The Son of Man uh, will go as it's been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves, which of them that might uh, betray him. It goes on, it goes on, until he gets to the story of Peter, and Jesus tells Peter that you even also, you may, the devil or Satan has put something for you. Shall we pray once again? Father, we thank you. As we reflect on your word, I pray that you open up your, our minds, that we may understand that seasons of every, every time, Lord, you can be able to go through them, but we can celebrate something. We give you praise, and I pray that you help us to understand that we can thrive through all seasons of life. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Many of you are wondering what I want to speak, because you are hearing betrayal, Jesus, Iscariot, and all that. But let me tell you, Jesus, just prior to his handing over, for the ultimate price he paid on the cross, he made a table that he prepared with the disciples. And to me, that is very important. If you will forget everything for my introduction or anything, when Jesus was almost going to suffer, he prepares a table. That is my, my context. If you understand that, you will walk with me. So Jesus, like many of us, went through many seasons, several seasons of life, and he thrived, including this, with his imminent death. And now, once a child we know, he was later a teenager, he was an adult, 
He grew up and we see him going through all the seasons of life. In his ministry life, we see Jesus moving from town to town, performing miracles. His career thrived amidst of even resistance at one point when Jesus was preaching and people were looking for him, not to be able to give him praise, but to finish him. But he thrived. And Jesus goes on the cross. By the way, after this, he has celebrated the, the, the Passover. And he's on the, before he breathes last, he says, it is finished. That is John chapter 19, verse 30. He did not cry and say, give me another opportunity like Samson did that I may revenge. He said, it is finished. What you are saying is, I must thrive. What I have come to do, I have accomplished. Today, I want us to focus on the season prior to his death as is outlined in this passage of Luke chapter 22 and see some several thoughts, three thoughts. One, it was a season of unleavened bread. And the Bible says, and the Passover was approaching. This is very important. Jesus, in this particular passage alone, it has some season that it was a season of unleavened bread. What was the season of unleavened bread? This was the first feast of, in the year, okay? The festival itself, it covered seven days with the first and the last days uh, being high Sabbath in which no work was or is done. It started with the Passover memorial. Both, in, uh, both feasts were considered as one and the names are often used interchangeably. But in purpose, they were slightly different. The Passover commemorated the deliverance of the Israelites. So when Jesus is almost going to the cross and is asking the disciples to come to the table, they are celebrating something in history. And sometimes history happens that you just want to do something and somebody of your long-time friends comes. It puts a memory in your celebration. So when Jesus is talking about all this, we are seeing a grand narrative of God, of deliverance, of freedom coming in play just before he suffers. And this is highlighted in this passage. Number two, I see a season of betrayal. Now, the season of betrayal from verse 3 to verse 5. While this was a season of thriving, the Lord's table, okay, the Lord's table, very good thing that we do for Jesus, his one close friends, the minister of finance, so to say, became the chief betrayer. Amen. He comes to the table. When Jesus is making the table, I want you to understand that every moment you make a table, you will not just make your friends. Hallelujah. We will always differ. And the closest, the one that keeps your money, <laughs> will be a betrayer. So even Jesus invites all of them. And it's also a season of betrayal. He actually gets a bribe, that is now Judas, to execute the betrayal. It's at the moment where the devil has entered his heart and his mind. And I want you to understand that in some seasons when you are almost doing the right thing, the devil will come to use one or the two people that are close to you. Then they become a betrayer. They may discourage you of the mission and vision of what you are doing. But now, here is the good news. Jesus is not sidetracked by this. In fact, he talks on the table. If you read the whole of that passage, at one point when he's serving the table, and they ask themselves, who? They think, but even Judas Iscariot knows himself. Now, he suffers the consequence of his hardness of his heart. Jesus does not overdwell on that. He thrives. He moves on to serve the table. And he gives them the cup. He gives them the bread. And he comes back to Peter. And they say, you also. You. They say that Peter and Judas were almost going the same route. They might have actually betrayed Jesus. Now, you see, Judas does not identify himself. When Jesus understands that there is a season of my betrayal and there is also my season of thriving. So when that season comes and everybody looks at themselves and they doubt themselves and they say, I'm not the one, I'm not the one. Judas keeps quiet and he sits in the table. Jesus moves on, serves the table. He comes to Peter. Peter denies many times and is restored. You need to understand that particular thing. Jesus does not quit. 
He does not continue to linger around and make himself like, I cannot move out from the house just because I voted. He moves on. He just mentions that I'm aware that there is tension, but I must move on. Praise the Lord. It's a season of betrayal that I stand here as a pastor and it doesn't mean that all of you will be with me. But I will not overdwell on the things that people are thinking. I have a mission that God has sent me to do. So Jesus moves on and he continues to do all that he wanted to do on that particular season. He doesn't allow discouragement. He thrives in that particular season. In fact, he moves on and he does many things. Somebody has said that uh, winners never quit and quitters never win. That's not from the Bible. But Jesus demonstrated the same. That he would not overdwell on this betrayal because he would have made even the disciples. And you know, Peter at one point was a man of anger. He would have cut one of his disciples the ear. I can tell you, Peter was no joke in this season. So Jesus did not want that. And so he moves on. What is the lesson here? That even in the moment of betrayal, there are lessons that you can take. Our elder McCormick preaching sometime back when we had COVID said, in there are some gems or the unfortunates that we can reap in the seasons of war. There are lessons that we can learn when we are discouraged. A man, I don't know whether we have that pictorial, was working very hard, working every day, and uh, many of you have seen it circulate sometime on WhatsApp, and he was looking for gold. He dug and he dug. Gold is always deeper. But he just gave up when he was three feet away from that. And... Uh, um, he went back home, and that is what many of us do when we are betrayed, when we are on the edge of getting whatever God sent you to do in Eldoret. You think, now I cannot be able to buy land here. So I, people are post-transactions. They won the election. Now, man, tell you, proceed and transact. Amen. You are just three feet to get your gold you are almost making an investment and now in the election we are opposed. Life must move on because quitters never win and winners never quit. Do not quit. Indeed, if you want to thrive in all seasons of life, be a Joseph, be a Jesus that is able to proceed with the table. It is said, keep keeping on. Get it done. Okay? Failure is just but temporal defeat. Get focused on your mission, on your vision and objectives. John chapter 6, verse 38 says in the New Living Translation, For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my will. In the season of betrayal, in the season of turbulence, we should always focus our eyes on our mission. We remind ourselves what we came to do as sit in this place. And I believe you also have something you believe that you want to do every time you put your hands on your plow. Keep keeping on. Amen? Do not allow anything to discourage. Number three, the season of the Last Supper. Now, this is the main one that I get in this place. Now, Jesus serves the Last Supper. Uh, before I talk about the Last Supper of Jesus, there was a Last Supper that somebody ate. He was being chased, and he ate last supper. <laughs> and so he passed on. <laughs> uh, he was being chased by the police. So I don't know whether you guys, I, I read a lot of news, but uh, I was trying to look at those episodes they, 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 when they were trying to talk of one of the criminals that was being tracked from Tika, and they showed the chapati, and they said that it was his last supper, not the last supper of the Bible. And uh, it, it ended. Now, the season of last supper, <laughs> your last milestone with people, a commemoration of your legacy, so to speak. What is the season of your legacy? So this is a season of celebration. You make preparation. You put everything. And Jesus even sends somebody to go and say, go and say, prepare a guest room. Jesus knew that he needed to celebrate. Some people will be celebrating, I know, later on. And then. But now the gist of this is that Put your house in order. Jesus calls all his people. Okay? It is said from our culture that when an old man is almost dying, the spirit will tell them, call my people to come. And when they call you, you realize your father is almost aging. You come first. Okay? So you are putting your house in order. Season of celebration. Work on succession. Speak blessings. 
to your team, to your spouse, to your children. Get them to know your passwords and secrets to success. Feast and put your eyes on God because the betrayer may also be in the midst. So that was the season of the Last Supper. But I will also get some few lessons in the, in the season of Last Supper. One, you learn the balance of life by avoiding extremes. Uh, Solomon, in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 16, says, Do not be overly righteous, nor be overly wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Do not be overly wicked, nor be foolish. Why should you die before your time? Avoid extremes. My brethren, I submit to you. I'm a Kenyan like you. Tanzanians have said Kenyans are overly political. They are extremely political, more than politicians. Now, the Solomon is saying this. If you are putting your life in order, avoid the extremes of life. I know some of you didn't buy, but there are some of you who have been having sleepless nights. I've come to talk to you. For you to drive, avoid extremes of life. Your own governor has been quoted almost in this whole country. Do not put elections in the heart. Put it in the lungs so that you can be able. Do not be overly righteous. Praise the Lord. This is a season of last supper, my friend. We are being served. It's being served now. Thank God I'm speaking. This is where we are. All of us, this is where we are. Put your house in order. I want you to start putting balance. Wake up. Don't accelerate too much. Don't put too much brake. Your vehicle will overturn. Praise the Lord. This is the season. We want to drive. We want to be friends. Hallelujah. Warn the undecided members. Verse 31. Peter, just like any other Jew that was planning a betrayal, I would rather, rather warn you now that if you are undecided of where to go, the season of celebration need to be able to make us know that we are in a team. We pray for them and affirm them as the leadership and we pray that God will help you. In this season again, we learn that prayer works. It changes Peter. It's not just changing him, it transforms him. In fact, he becomes the first bishop of the church when Christ is gone because Christ, during the Last Supper, he affirmed him. Who do you affirm during your Last Supper? Your season. I'm talking about seasons of life. Betrayal, we've jumped that. We are on the supper now before we are being served. Learn the way. Verse 9. Hmm? The Bible says in verse 9 that where do you want us to prepare it? No many of you are wondering where the celebration will be. Where will be my crying? Also, you choose a place to cry. You know? yeah? Where will it be? Where will it be? Where do you celebrate your victories? And who do you celebrate? The same. What? Verse 10 to 13 talks about the cup and everything that are supposed to be. So who is on the table? Every person is on the table of this celebration. The inner circle should always be close to you in all seasons. If you are discouraged, find out some people that you can vent frustrations. Yeah? Do not just trash and put everything under the carpet if you want to thrive. Men will suffer this. Uh, during many times men do not open up. Ladies cry and they help you. For many people that are suffering heart disease, because we don't speak out, we just suffer. And somebody has told us that men don't cry. It's time to be able to know that. During this, when you look at who during this last supper, reprimand some. I see Jesus, yeah? He's reprimanding them. He did not suck them. Now, you need to be very careful. We are talking about season. Maybe you are a CEO. I'm speaking from all perspective of where we are as a country or where you are as an organization. There are moments sometimes when you want to just make that farewell. Do not just trash people. Jesus, like the colonialists, and I believe the colonialists did this, one of my mentors told me. They were not sucking people when they did a mistake. They reprimanded them and said, I've given you the first warning. I give you the second warning. I thank God he gave him the third one. And Peter said, I am there. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now, this is it. The season of celebration. It makes some people reprimanded, they will do better than when they are thrashed because they can become greater enemies. The season of the Last Supper dealing with who? Some of them know your secrets. 
So if you deal with them just like this, they can show you when they are away that indeed they are powerful. Okay? And they indeed they can really put you down when you thought you would put them. And during the last supper on that table, when you were driving, disclose the disloyal members. Praise the Lord. Dis disclose the disloyal members. Verse 21 to 23. Okay? Let me read that because I didn't read it. The Bible says this. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with me on the table. The son of man will go as it has been decreed. But woe to that man who betrays him. Now, this is for the prayer warriors. Let's not go to prayer and think that we call things as they are and pray that God will help us accomplish the will of God. You decree and look at what are some mistakes and all that. Because they say like in a cake, we have, it is made of both sweetness and things that are bitter. But learn to thrive. Learn to thrive. This does not hint Jesus. Jesus says he is decreed that he may accomplish that which he's going to do. <coughs> the next thing I see there is he builds the team spirit. Verse 24 all the way to 30. There was no great person there. In fact, at one point when Jesus is speaking and uh, verse 27 says, For who is greater? The one who is at the table or the one who serves? You see, that thing is playing around. They say, if you want to thrive in all seasons, learn to work like Jesus. Jesus did not have a table with corners. He didn't have senior pastor and deputy senior pastor. He had a round table where all disciples were equal. At one point when they asked who is greater, he did not feel good. For you to thrive, always value people as they are equal to, all, to each other. One as face and. The problem of seeing others being higher and lesser is what puts our country in a mess many times. We are going there so that we can reduce that which is in the greater community to the lesser community. Do you understand the Dawambua? And many of us that are here, you are wondering, and people remind you of some people that are not there. Jesus did not want that. He wanted these people to be together. And he served them. In fact, they say that even um, John was more closer to Jesus than Peter. Okay? He was more obedient than any other. And that's how Jesus walked until people cannot say who was now to be the bishop when he did left. All of us are equal if we want to thrive as a church. Praise the Lord. If we will have that spirit of Jesus, of that team spirit, then we will not be able to have anything else, but we will have the syndrome. We will have the all that it needs that we will thrive in all seasons. Amen? Even times when you don't serve your children equally, you will always find there are some dissensions and many things. Learn the how. Explain the journey of success. You see, Jesus, when he's serving the table, I normally do this with Pastor Patrick, we'll be doing it with Pastor Petronila and many of you. When you are taking the table, you say, wait for one another. Okay? Jesus teaches them how to celebrate. Okay? He breaks the bread and he says, this is my body that is broken for you. Actually, he teaches them brokenness. He te tells them that this is my body, preciously broken as an ultimate price for our redemption. He tells them about the blood which is eventually poured for us. What am I saying about this season of celebration? Without Christ, there is no life. And so for us to have life, even if we are going through turbulence, we must celebrate Christ. We must find joy in everything. We go through many turns and bouts in life as seasons of life. And every iota of the season has a meaning to our timely end. Let's learn to celebrate everything in Christ. Jesus was celebrating, and I wonder what he was trying to do. He was trying to exude joy, which is not just a mere happiness, but something that he understood that was in his heart. Some four points, then we will be done how to thrive in all seasons. One is constant reassess your spiritual work. Now, I'm taking you back to a parallel verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26 to 27, which says, For as often as you eat this bread, we normally read that, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let me read it again. As often, I love it, this was the new King James, but 
The NIV says, whenever you, you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we want to constantly celebrate the Holy Communion until Jesus comes. You know, there are Christians that are in holiday in this political season. Hallelujah. I want you to go and reassess. Reassess because you've been assessing. Reassess. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, reassess. Yes, you reassess your spiritual work. Jesus constantly reminded his disciples how to stay closer to him. I'm telling you, if you do not remind yourself, we will just be like of the world. Okay? Even you, a single chance, would make somebody like Peter and the, the highly confidential man, Judas, who was having the password today, who would betray him. So he said, whenever you drink this, he didn't know that. Um, Judas would finish himself. If Judas would have come and served another Holy Communion and introspected himself, I'm telling you, things would have, I want you to go and think about yourself and serve a Holy Communion for yourself, not this one that we do here. In your mind, and remind yourself of a celebration season, even though you are in a different place. Number two, consistent, be open-minded. And Jesus says, examine yourself. That is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28 to 32. Examine yourself and be open to God's will and answer. But let a man examine himself. No, this is an open check. That now, no, no, I don't want to look like I'm condemning you, my people, sit a in this place. The Bible says, let a man or a woman examine himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner drinks and uh, uh, eats and drinks judgment on himself, not designing the Lord's body. For this reason, men are weak and sick among you, and the men are asleep. For we are, if we would judge ourselves, we will not be judged. But when we are judged, we are being chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. An open check of happiness to thrive. Praise the Lord. In another verse in Revelation, which I have not put here, the Bible says, I have placed an open door before you of life and death. So you choose and write the amount. You write your happiness. You write whether you are thriving or not. I love it many times, you know, and I would be saying later on, you know, you're given an open check. Some of you just sit and you don't pray anything to God. God hears our prayer. Even in this season, don't be quiet and just look as if um, um, answers will come from IBC and else. Pray what you God wants. I'm praying for peace. I'm praying for prosperity, irrespective of everything. Praise the Lord. Now, that will be an open check God has given us to write in our mouths. We examine ourselves consistently. Consistently. He says as often as you do it. Number three, courageously take chances. First Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. What does it say? It says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. Okay? On the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, This is my body which is broken for you. He's taking chances of celebration. Hallelujah. There is always an opportunity to correct our ways. Like Pastor Patrick, I'll put him here. He doesn't say, how many of you want to give your life to Christ? You can take another second chance that he always does, which I always don't do, and say, all of us, let's say this prayer after me. Now, that is a chance for you that if you are not born again, you can be born again in a crowd. Praise the Lord. Taking a chance. And Jesus had this with all disciples, some of them going wayward south, and he's giving them a celebration. And some of you have never taken those chances. I ever told you that I led myself to Christ one day. I was to preach and I felt that I am a neighbor. I, I cried. The moment I was jumping, I was seated this side and I moved through this. So it was a big stage and I was feeling so intimidated. I said a prayer of confession like that of a sinner. I don't know why I said that prayer, but I have ever led myself to Christ. Take chances. Praise the Lord. When the country is angry and many people are praying and this music team are singing, 
Is there no moment to go before God and say, Lord, I almost gave up on you. I want to ask that you may forgive me. And when they will be asking you, I only saw one hand, they say, there was one that took the chance. Praise the Lord. Courageously take chances and that will be of your benefit. Jesus, while he was doing that, Judas did not. Peter did it. Praise the Lord. Peter took that. In fact, I say, he took that chance. And then he was forgiven. Otherwise, the Geolathians agreed that Judas and Peter knew this plot. Some of you know some things more than me. I'm just speaking out of my mind. Praise the Lord. Courageously take risks. Number last, cordially give thanks. Cordially give thanks. Verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 24a. The Bible says this. Um, uh, what does uh, verse 24 verse 24 says um, that and when he had given thanks uh, that is first Corinthians. He broke it and said take it uh, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when he had given thanks. Now some of you are not giving thanks. They have said that a thankful heart is a thankful heart. Okay? It's a thankful heart. And an grateful heart, it is just that, a thank that is not. This is what Jesus, he took the bread and said, thank you, Lord. I wonder why Jesus was giving thanks. Here he's having Judas on the table. The death is imminent, is coming. Cordially give thanks. When I was growing up, my aunt used to punish us. And after punishing us, she expected you to say thank you. And sometimes, we, I was given a lot of strokes. She was a teacher. <laughs> after she was done, I ran away. She said, come back. Because when you are told to come back, you just be given another stick. It was not, we are not being told to give thanks. So you just be given until you say thanks. So I was given one, I called her I went, I brought again. I was given, say, thank you. Now, that is not the thank you God expects us to give you. Praise the Lord. A painful thing. He want a cordial. Being cordial. Hallelujah. Now, if you want to thrive in all seasons, cordially give thanks. Many people are not thriving. And I will hinge on this point as I bring this sermon to a close. Because we are always on a mountain complaining. And even when we are giving thanks, we are saying thank you. And we are crying. You are not giving the cordial thanks God expects. And Jesus says, after he had given thanks, he broke it. He was very happy to break his body for the disciples to celebrate. Very cordial in giving thanks. And so, that is the secret of surviving and thriving in all seasons. Otherwise, you will get stress, you get hostile, you come for a charity kitty, you will not be able to manage it until we put you down. Because stress is killing more people than sicknesses. Praise the Lord. Cordially give thanks. Whichever that we're going through, you want to give thanks. God is a good God. I want to conclude and say this. While this episode marked the most difficult season in Jesus' life, it is also the most celebrated episode. In fact, as in Sitam, we have two critical things that we celebrate as um, uh, as ordinances. One is the Lord's table and another one is baptism. Praise the Lord. Those two. And I want to tell you that every evangelical, every biblical believing church would do that. Jesus did that and celebrated that when his body was being served. When his body was being served. This is because he wanted to set a foundation for a Christian belief, and he did set that. And so he celebrated the Passover feast just before he was betrayed. We can choose, we can choose to thrive in all circumstances if we follow Christ. 